Okay, and welcome back. And we're having a conversation with Neil Donald Walsh. And Neil, before the break, we're talking about that park. You said that you were contemplating buying it. What would you have done with it? Well, I was looking around. It was after the book had uh, done very well, mm -hmm. and I was beginning to receive royalty checks, and they were not small checks. And I started calling real estate agents because I wanted to take the income that had been earned from those movies, or, I mean from those books, and uh, put them into something that would have lasting value, and that I wouldn't just you know, squander the money, because mm. I'd never seen that kind of money in my life, as you can imagine. <laughs> Me neither. So, so well, most people haven't. <laughs> you know, it's just a, a dream come true for anybody, really. Mm. So um, in any event, I was, try I was thinking of establishing a, an intentional community, and then finding a place where I could invite anybody to come in, and the honest truth is I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't even require $25 a week. I would just let it be open to anybody. We'd have some ground rules. I would sit down and talk to the fellas and say, okay, guys, here's the story. Mm -hmm. you, you can't hurt me here. You gotta, be, you gotta be straight up with me and play square and try not to do anything illegal that gets me in trouble, but if we can play square with each other, we can stay here. That was the thought I had. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, I didn't think about this place, though, interestingly enough, I never because I didn't know it was available. I didn't know it was for sale in real life. The agent took me around, and, and, and uh, there it was for sale. Oh, my God. Again, oh. it had been turned over two or three times. And I uh, drove into that driveway, and I thought, oh, my heavens. Mm -hmm. Can this be surreal or real? I'm standing here with the ability to buy this entire park where a couple of years ago I had to scrape together enough uh, coins to just stay on four square feet mm. of it. Mm. So it was... Um, and the bus fare to get out of there to go yeah. to that interview. Oh, a huge thing. You know, oh. when, when you're, um, Robin, when you're on the street, mm. getting off the street is virtually impossible because not only do you smell bad and look bad, but you can't even pull together the $2 it takes to get the bus fare to go to a job interview if you had a job interview. Mm. So it's, you know, it's to the average person, it seems like, what's the big deal? Why don't those people just get a job like the rest of us? Once you're in that situation, getting out of there is unbelievably difficult. You've got to pull together what to a street person is a fortune mm. just to go to a job interview. Mm. Get, a, get, a, you know, get, a, get a shower someplace, wherever you can find a place to get a shower. Now, I was fortunate because the park that I was in actually had public showers there because it was a public campground. Yeah. So they had public showers. So what guys will do on the street, if they can find a nearby um, public park or a camp facility, they'll walk there if they have to, once a week anyway, and jump into the into the public showers and, and grab a quick shower. Mm. Maybe even wash their clothes a little bit and bring some extra clothing and wash it in the sink or whatever. Take it back, all crushed up. They don't care about ironing, but they hang it out to dry back over a tree limb or something when they're back at camp. And they've semi clean mm. for the next 10 days. So it's, uh, what, it's not an easy one, way to live. Just one step above, I guess, being on the street. Although yes, it's, it's probably not. Yeah, mm. not, a, not an easy way to live. Yeah. Well, going back further in your journey before that, Neil, um, you got brothers and sisters? Close, yeah, yes, yeah? yes. Well, I, I, I did. Um, all but one of them has passed away. But I had, um, I had three brothers, no sisters. Mm -hmm. um, you the oldest, or? No, I was the youngest, actually. Oh, you're the baby. Yeah. Okay. And your mum and dad, what sort of work did they do? My father was um, in the post office for many years in the United States, and he was a labor leader. He was a, uh, um, a union leader uh, in the postal union in the U.S., uh, and he worked at the post office for more than 40 years, I think 43 or 45 years, retired well, after all those years, ultimately retired from management. He ultimately left the union and became part of, part of management, and he was a postal supervisor in the last 10 or 12 years of his working life. My mom was a homemaker. She died at my age now. Mm -hmm. I often think about that uh, when I get up in the morning. My mother didn't live longer than I am old now. I seem so young to myself. And I think to myself, gosh, if my mom felt about her life the way I feel about my life now, she must have felt when she was ready to die, I've only just begun. Mm -hmm. It can't be over this fast. If somebody told me that I was going to die this year, which could happen, of course, but if I knew in advance, I would think, oh my gosh, I thought I had at least 10 or 15 or 20 years or more left here to finish it up, tidy it up, get done those last things I really wanted to get done, experience those things I wanted to experience.
My mother didn't have that opportunity. She died at 63, which is how old I am. Mm -hmm. But she was a wonderful mother, a wonderful homemaker. She never worked outside of the house. She spent her whole life raising her children. She was an angel. You said that actually in the, um, the acknowledgements for book one of Conversations with God, that she was the first angel you met. Yeah. Yeah. That, that um, scene in the movie, uh, yourself as a little boy and your mum, what was that symbology? What was that to do with? Well, my mother fancied herself to be a mystic. I think she was a mystic, actually. Okay. Uh, and she did a lot of work in that area at a time in our culture when it was not popular or not so accepted to do that. These days, it's almost de rigueur at, at mm. some level. Uh, but in those days, back in the uh, 1940s and 1950s, it was not decidedly not acceptable. So she would do, you know, card readings or read people's palms or whatever, um, almost on the sly, as it were. Uh, she'd bring in her relatives and friends and people from down the street, and they were not not to tell anyone, not to really let the word go out too far, because she'd be ridiculed. But one thing she did was um, palm reading, and I watched her do that from the time I was three and four years old. She had people come in, she earned a few extra pennies. They used to leave, she never charged anyone, but they would leave you know, a little bit of money. Not a lot, but she'd make some pin money for herself that way. And she enjoyed doing it because she felt she was being of service to people who really wanted to have some other insight into their life. So I watched her do this, you see, at my kitchen table for, for years. And every day I would say, every so often I would say, read my, read my palms, Mom. And she'd say, oh, no, no, honey, when you're older, when, when you're a bit older, when you can understand more. Well, finally one day, I was about eight or nine, I think I just begged her to the point where she couldn't say no. I said, come on, Mom, you've been telling me for a long time, just read my palms. And uh, poor dear, she looked down and meaning nothing by it, but if you look at my palms, I have headlines that go clear across both hands. Yeah. They're very unusual. When I've gone to professional palm readers, they look at them and they have the same astonishment that my mother did. Even a professional palm reader today would look at this and say, well, I've seen one hand like that, but never two. So it looks as if you have no heart line on either hand. Oh. And I said to, to uh, her, as I've said to palm readers, well, what does that mean? And they've said, well, it means you know, you'll never love anybody in the classic sense. You love people with your mind. Mm -hmm. It's a mental, largely a mental process with you, but it's not something you get all emotionally caught up in. Well, when my mother told me that at, at eight, eight and a half or nine years old, you, uh, she said, baby, you'll never love anybody. There was more, of course, to the story. Sure. The, the scene didn't end there in real life. Yeah. But I, I said to her, well, well, what does that mean? She said, well, it means that you'll, you're different from the rest of us and you experience life differently. And you experience life and you look at life and, and you explore life largely as a deep, deep, deep mental process, not as an emotional process. And that's how you'll experience love as well. So don't be surprised if you, don't, you have a difficult time in your life getting all emotionally caught up in the drama around love relationships. To you, it be, will be largely a pretty much cut and dried mental experience. And, and loving people, in your case, will be a decision, a choice you will make, not an uncontrollable head over heels kind of a thing. So she explained mm -hmm. that to me. Well, I, I, you know, that, that affected me. She didn't intend to damage me in any way. Mothers never do, parents never do. But I heard that in a different way than she sent it to me. So my, what the movie tried to depict was the impact that that one sentence had on me in my life because from that day on, every time I got into a relationship with a woman, those words echoed in my ear. You know, it's a, you know, you'll never love anybody. You'll mm -hmm. never love anybody. So mm -hmm. from the time I was 16 on, into my puberty right through to my 50th and 60th year, I would look at women and uh, immediately have that, that thought in my head. So of course I got into, why bother? Mm -hmm. Why try? It's not going to work anyway. Mm -hmm. They can't, they'll never, and uh, so my relationships were in a sense do doomed from the start because I was just playing out my mother's prediction. That's what they were trying to show in the movie. Wow, that's huge. We'll take another break and we'll come back and find out more about Neil's journey and the work in his world. Back with you soon.